I'm Christopher Nolikin at Bulger Veterinary Hospital. Hi, I'm Lindsay Benzulo. Talking today about allergies and pets. Spaying and neutering your pet. Pet weight management. And we're going to talk today about pet summer fun and safety. Okay. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but doctor. Mm-hmm. So she says, I got you got a treat, girl. You got a lot of treats. A, a lot of TV treats. Up on that table. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Christopher Nolikin. I'm Dr. Lindsay Renzulo, and we have a special guest in the studio today. Yeah. So we have Mr. Uh, I said Mr. Jeremy <laughs> Cohen, who's a Boston dog attorneys yes Boston yes. dog lawyers Boston dog lawyers and so we were here today wanting to talk about um, kind of all the legal issues that are associated with pets most specifically I guess dogs is what you run into more often but you do we handle all sorts of pets that's the number one thing they have to be a pet mm -hmm. uh, horses uh, parrots now we got a case about a squirrel and that's oh not boy. supposed to be a pet so we didn't take <laughs> oh. that one uh, but a dog cat we do have a lot of cat custody cases Mm. Where people split up and they they fight over who should so have the cat. So more with cats than dogs. We have an equal number with mm -hmm. dogs, mm -hmm. but most of the cat cases I get Our are custody, custody cases. cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So right. just I, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into it and sure. like where you practice and and what you primarily do. So uh, I really hated being a lawyer uh, <laughs> for the first eighteen <laughs> years of start. my practice, and then um, I got a case where my stepkids their dog bit somebody and he was there was going to be a hearing and so for a dangerous dog and i called ahead and they said there's nothing to worry about you don't even have to come but i went anyway and they right away they voted to kill the dog Whoa. and they had never evaluated jesse he was a german shepherd they didn't look at any of the facts and it just didn't seem right because i knew this dog so uh that kind of lit a fire just how quickly they arrived at the decision so i filed an appeal made the local papers, there were cartoons about it, and that's where this, I found my passion that uh, it's, it's about pet owner's rights, and uh, there's so many things that can happen with our pets. Lots of it I didn't even think of when I started the firm, Boston Dog Lawyers, but now uh, we get calls often and just some crazy scenarios, but the, the main four are dangerous dogs that are threatened to be put down, uh, civil lawsuits because your dog bites somebody, emotional support animals, or um, harm to your pet if a if anybody a professional or not may have harmed your pet wrongful pet injury or wrongful pet death and in custody cases wow very cool so now you don't practice any other law at this point right yeah. i am 99 percent this wow. and have phased out pretty much everything else that's wow. fantastic and your business you said is is pretty busy right yeah yeah I, it was a risk launching this and there were a lot of days you know my head was in my hands like all right, this is gonna. Is this gonna? Can you make a living doing this? But there's a huge need, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of fun. I keep adding staff, and uh, there's a lot of people that need help. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, we I do was see curious a lot. if that was your exclusive practice or if it was just a subset of what you do. But yeah, yeah that's amazing. That's amazing. And I mean, we do obviously. You know, when we have, you know, here at Bulger, we have the general practice side, but we have the ER side. And I feel like with the ER side is sort of where you see a lot of the cases that you can see being potential cases where a lawyer might need to be involved and probably one of the biggest ones that we do see is those the hit by car dogs you know where you have a dog that you know the owner is you know out on a walk maybe the dog's on a leash maybe the dog's not on a leash the dog got out of the yard and gets hit by a car and there's a lot of question about who sort of you know who's sort of to blame right if you will and, and, and th that's our society right yep. if something bad happens try to find somebody to blame right. sometimes you know, a lot of these cases come down to the pet owner yeah. and the management of the dog. And what I've learned through this practice over the last three years is, wow, as a pet owner, I, I get better every day. I didn't realize how much I don't know. And nobody really teaches you this until something happens. Mm -hmm. But with the car accidents, was your dog on a leash? Mm -hmm. So if your dog was on a leash and you were walking it and, it and somebody hit it with a car, it would seem that the auto insurer should be liable. So that's why you have insurance for property damage or damage to to people and dogs under the law are considered property. But then if the scenario is that the, the dog got loose and was running into the street, well now the defense for the driver would be, yeah, but that dog was violating the leash law, mm -hmm. which is a defense, but that might just limit or lower the amount that the person driving is liable, is responsible. They It might not absolve them of, of everything, but 
uh, violating the leash law and having your dog get hurt is not a bar to, to you seeking compensation. I always, I always generally, like with my non-legal abilities, kind of sort through those in saying if your dog wasn't on a leash, then, you know, it, it seems unfair. But <laughs> Yeah, and this is why people don't even know that they could – Right. Go to an attorney because you would assume that, right? Oh, my dog. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and any vet questions I get, I will forward to you. No. The things we know and things we don't know. I but, need to forward those um, all to you. Yeah. So, yeah, there's 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 avenues to for compensation yeah. or to help you, especially with vet bills. I mean, that's interesting though, too, because if you think about it, with if you take a pet part out of it, right, and a person, let's say a kid runs into yes. the street, yeah, clearly there's going to be some liability on the part of the driver almost no matter what, right? If it's a child. Right. But then if it's a dog, I don't know why we all of a sudden say, oh, no, the dog wasn't on a leash. You right, know? But right. Because the driver's still, like all of us driving, have, have to keep to a aware. safe lookout. You know, was the driver distracted, texting, speeding? Yeah. So those are, you, you got to look at all the factors mm-hmm. before you can come to a conclusion. Have you ever had a case where um, the dog got loose, got hit by a car, but because of that, it actually caused an accident with the car, and so the car owner went after the dog owner? I haven't had that yet, but that is absolutely a scenario uh, happen, for right? a good case. So, yeah. uh, and, and what would happen there is, I think liability could be spread out over a number of people, including the dog right. owner. Yeah. Uh, but if the dog caused the accident, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah. I, arguments can be made on both sides, but uh, usually when there's multiple car accidents, if somebody rear ends another car, it, liability keeps getting right. Uh, sp- spread over the group because you'll say that the person who hit the car in front of you probably didn't keep a safe lookout or was, right. or was following too closely. So it's it's rare to get 100% on one person or, mm. or one party. Mm-hmm. But that's an interesting yeah. Yeah. scenario. Because we'll you come up with that. all kinds yeah. of scenarios. Well, yeah, I mean, it, all things could happen. But, yeah. yeah, I think the dog that hit by a car, I feel like it's a lot of, it's a very high emotional situation. You know, people are coming in with their dogs that could be, you know, sig- seriously or significantly injured and, um, there's obviously concern about people, you know, who's going to be paying this veterinary bill right. because it's a, it that's be always the tough part too, because, you know, you pay your veterinary bills up front and don't really know if someone else is going to be able to help you with that. So it's like, you have to make that jump first and say, I'm going to pay this $5,000 bill. Right. And you might make a different decision if you knew that that was definitely going to be, but there's no way to know. There's no, no way to know. How long do those cases drag? They probably for like, like months and months, right? Oh, of getting auto oh, yeah. insurance to actually compensate and people appropriately. Also, homeowner's insurance. Mm-hmm. So uh, for liability insurance, you also have homeowner's insurance. So if somebody injures your dog in some other way or somebody's dog gets loose and attacks your dog, there could be coverage under renters or homeowner's insurance. But mm-hmm. I get calls from people who say, I went to the vet today. It's $5,000. I need you to call this other place and tell them we need the money now. And it yeah, just that doesn't, doesn't that. Yeah. yeah, They have to be able to at least put the bill to start with. Right, yeah. right. Um, how about the, so dog bites are another one I know you, you've dealt with both in the dangerous dogs, but also probably, you know, between two owners and who, sure who's so, liable. Um, well, everybody thinks it's the other dog's fault, right? And so we, I look at... No, we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, we have, uh, it, it's not just me, it's the staff and it's people right. who... Uh, I have look at the bites, behaviorists, even right. veterinarians who will say, oh, based on this bite and where it was or how deep it was, you can see if somebody was the aggressor or not. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is trespassing. Mm-hmm. If that dog came onto my property and attacked my dog, mm-hmm. and if those cases are, are more clearly, uh, the liability is more clear, but then you can look at what the fence was like. Did the, was the fence designed to keep dogs out? Could dogs dig in and get into the yard? Mm. Uh, did your dog dig out from the yard to get somewhere? So there's so many factors. And I think the most frustrating thing for any client when it comes to money is this is a family member and they are, right. it's not enough for them to just say, oh, my vet bills got paid. Because what about the, the anxiety, the, the diminished quality of the dog's life? We have a dog right now that is on eight medications for the rest of her life, was on life support was on a feeding tube, doesn't have the energy that she used to have, yeah. and, and it, it is clearly somebody's fault. And we were in court yesterday on it. This has to do with a boarding facility. Her name's Lily, little West Highland Terrier, and the boarding facility chose to clean around her in her cage. She was never boarded before. She was about 12 when it happened, and they cleaned around her, 
and she got ill, and her paws started to burn. Her oh, and wow. she licked her paws. Her tongue, half her tongue was burned off. She got pneumonia. Oh. And here, the the owners in in me when I take the call, this is not just about the eighteen thousand right. dollars in bills. What about the the loss of your companion? But the law doesn't see it that way. And yesterday we were in court on this case, and it's the first time I've had to I've been able to make the argument why the owner should be entitled to more than just emotional sort of damage. Right, emotional yeah. distress. Um, and don't we have to kind of how are we going to police this these this activity? Because the response from the the boarding facility was look when when Lily didn't come out of her cage when we went to clean it she consented to what came next so they're trying to say a dog consented to having her paws burned off yeah and the judge great judge but he said are there any cases in Massachusetts where you can bring me to where it says that owners are entitled to more than just uh, the the vet bills and right, right now we can't but yeah. we got to keep filing these cases and break through we need a, the legislator legislature to just change the law so dogs are more than property. Not that they're people, but that there's a special a special relationship that should that bond should somehow have a have a dollar amount on it when it when it's jeopardized. Mm, interesting, very interesting. That strikes fear in veterinarians, I will say. It does. It can yeah, hook and flip. Yeah, yeah, it can go the other side too. Because if something, you know, <clears throat> as far as a veterinarian is concerned, if something either goes, you know there's a problem with the treatment or the surgery or whatever, we can see lawsuits getting opened up fairly frequently for higher dollar amounts. But very large I mean, you can, we can't have it both ways. We can't say that we want owners to spend $18,000 to care for right. their pet and have that emotional bond and then not say that they're entitled to some emotional or bond. Or have us acknowledge it, that there is an emotional bond yeah. that goes along with pet ownership. We all have it. I think it. we've had it kind of a little bit too easy in some ways. Well, it's yeah. refreshing to hear that because yeah. I've read a lot about why we don't, the reasons not to look at them as more than property. And the number one thing is because vets, your rates will go up, your insurance will go up, and you'll have to charge us more money. But you do humanize them. Yeah. Even in the mm-hmm. law, I mean, the law talks about dogs. If it's a dangerous dog, you know, they, they had hatred in them, and they had this sort of aggression. or they right, had, they're they putting emotions on right? them. Yeah. So they'll humanize the dog when it comes to certain things, but yeah. then when it comes to uh, evaluating the dog, putting a dog mount, you mm-hmm. just say, oh, it's property. It's property, yeah. right. And I think that uh, when I get a call about a vet issue, because, of course, some of these dogs died, and the first thing they, they do is uh, is think, is this somebody else's fault? Mm-hmm. It's very rarely I have found the veterinarian's fault, and but you kind of have to sift through that yeah. and explain mm-hmm. to them. But uh, people just think there's automatically somebody did something wrong, mm-hmm. and I should be I should be compensated. But pet owners have this energy and this guilt it's this guilt that they have, like, oh, if I had just gone to a different vet or if I had just and done my that thing test is, or I did, yeah. yeah. My yeah. thing is, well, you probably should have done the, the stronger diagnostic test up front because right. when you find out they took a very conservative route first because cost was a factor, and then you, you see that things deteriorated for the right. dog, you can kind of see where the pet owner contributes to that in, mm-hmm. in some of the instances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think we never want to cast blame either. Like, I think that there's oftentimes there's mutual sort of blame to be had. I don't yeah. know, you know. Yeah. But my thing is, is it's okay to question authority. I mean, this whole my whole firm is about questioning the way things have been done, and just engage your vet in conversation. Because some people say I was telling my vet this was the issue. And they weren't hearing me. Well, find another way to make sure that right. they hear you. Right. you know, demand right. that they hear you. And yeah. then uh, then at least you know um, whatever you thought was the issue is being mm-hmm. addressed. But that fails to look at the fact that, you know, vets are, you're the authority. I mean, you're the, mm-hmm. you're the smarter mm-hmm. people. And if it's assumed that you hear everything that we have to say yeah. and you've mm-hmm. sorted it out. Yeah. Um, and that's funny that, you know, going back to the property case, so I'm just thinking about, you had mentioned about the fencing issue being a, a potential complication or a complicating factor as far as liability is concerned. I sort of always assumed if a dog entered onto that area, the property of that homeowner's, that that was not necessarily the home homeowner's fault. But you, you're saying there's actually a possibility where there could be some liability with the homeowner that they didn't put up an appropriate barrier to get into their yard or their home area. Right. So under the law, if somebody trespasses onto your property and gets bit, under the law, they can't recover. And I argue your dog can't be deemed dangerous because your dog was on its own property. So mm-hmm. somebody 
comes onto your property and your dog bites right. them. Right. Right. But right now, a dog can't trespass because property can't necessarily trespass. So, uh, and I've, I'm both. I've argued it both ways, but right. um, so if. But it just stands to reason that if you if a dog comes on your property, your dog will react, and uh, that's just silly. If you put a yeah. dangerous item on someone's property, it's not your. Well, that's what I argue. Like, fault. Yeah. I, isn't but, the? But it could go that I could see it both. Isn't ways. the pet owner by not watching over the dog or right. letting it just run right. free? Basically, the pet owner is trespassed. Right. I, I right. think. Right. Um, but it. I guess it depends on who I'm. The representing. situation. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, interesting. Right. Well, and, and each, it seems like each situation is so individual, right? That's what's so interesting about the practice mm-hmm. is I, I give everybody up to a half hour on the phone. That's mm-hmm. how the calls come in. And just fascinating scenarios. And, and no two days in my office are the same. Mm-hmm. And that's what keeps the juices flowing. Plus, yeah. um, saving dogs or um, uh, saving dogs is, yeah. is, is a huge rush mm-hmm. yeah. when a dog is about to be put down and in wrongfully yeah there's some dogs that might need to be put down mm-hmm. yeah. if we've exhausted all the potential remedies because there's so many yeah um if as long as we've exhausted them properly then i can get comfortable that maybe a dog just can't be rehabilitated mm-hmm. but yep. there's a right way to get there mm-hmm. and that's why that's why i do this well and so some of the other patients i mean with cats and stuff we see at least on the general practice side we see a lot of people saying i found this cat I want this cat to be named Fluffy, and this is going to be my new my new pet. They bring it into us at, for their first exam, and one of the things that we always do as veterinarians is we'll always scan them for to a microchip. look for a microchip to make sure that they don't have a previous owner. And sometimes it pops up that they do have one, and in that case, the owner might not have known that the cat went missing, or it might be the ex-wife's cat that that the husband actually really does want, but they gave it away or they let it go. I mean, those those must be really muddy too. Those cases. Just yesterday, Bubba Jr. was the um, dog's name, and it was a call from Georgia. And he said, look, I found this dog two weeks ago, no collar, and I brought it into the vet, no microchip. Yeah. And then I posted it every place I was supposed to about a lost dog, and he notified the police, the animal control. And ultimately, a couple of people came forward, and he didn't believe that they were the owners. They mm. really couldn't... He, this potential client did the test of putting, he put the phone up to the dog's ear and had the person who said they were the owner <laughs> speak to the dog. It, I, that's not exactly the, the best right. way to do it. Yeah. But then he got a call and said, if you don't turn this dog in, uh, we will arrest you. Because he felt, I found the dog and nobody's proved ownership, so I want to keep it. And I was explaining to him, the likelihood that he would ever be able to keep this dog is so minimal because really? even if they can't find the owner, it doesn't just go to doesn't him. Doesn't mean it's his dog. Now it might yeah. go to a, a shelter and he'll have to do an application. Right. And so the scenarios you get, where right on the spot somebody brings the right. the pet in, you can't make a decision about whose it is. Right. And there's so many factors to look at into who owns the pet, mm-hmm. not just the paperwork from when they adopted it or purchased it, but I look at who's the financial manager, who's mm-hmm. been paying for the for the pet, who's been going to the vet, and a lot of times your records are are so important, be, but it tends some, that your records tend to only put one name mm-hmm. as an owner That's a true. lot. I've seen yeah. a vet record, so true. we have multiple names, but oftentimes it's not always clear who who brought the pet in on right. each individual time or who actually made the payment, right? And even right. if we do have some accounts with multiple owners, there's plenty of accounts that just have. The wife felt the paperwork, and it's only the wife's because name. They, they don't there. think about it. Yeah, they don't yeah. think about it. Sometimes it's just that person's name because they have a different work schedule, and they could come right. in when the other person was working. You don't even so. know there was a spouse, and right. then all of a sudden there's this random person in front of your leg, or who yeah, are you? I haven't met you before. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, but there seems to be a strong code among veterinarians that unless you're on the paperwork, we are not releasing information, mm-hmm. and that's good. That yeah. that I think foils a lot of. Um, plots where people Mm -hmm. are trying to get a pet that they probably shouldn't be able to yeah yeah there was an interesting i think it was from our our liability insurance that shocked me a little bit that was suggesting that the person who is standing there in front of you with the pet stating that they're the owner is sort of by default the owner regardless of what the what the microchip says and everything It it seems like that's way simplifying the situation and that it's way more complicated than that and that's not i would never for example euthanize a pet 
because this person is standing in front of me saying this is my pet. Right. Right. It's, yeah. Krista, I was in, um, in court just two weeks ago on a custody issue. And that line of thinking that whoever has the dog, I, the Possession judge. Possession is nine-tenths of the law, That right? thing, right. this judge, I was before me, said, well, your client doesn't have the dog right now. And he said, when I was in law school, which was probably easily 100 years ago, <laughs> and I knew what he was about to say. And because it's a dog case, there's a little bit of, yes. it's a little more casual. Right. It's sometimes too casual from, from the judge's point of view. But I knew what he was going to say. I said, please, Your Honor, don't say it. Please don't say possession. And he said possession is nine tenths of the law. I don't. I don't know that legal um, concept. I came back to my office. I have my paralegal research. There's. There's nothing. There's nothing that in says the that. actual written case law. And, and I have another case where a judge uh, said, "Well, I'm not taking the dog away from um, from the ex girlfriend to give it to my client, the ex boyfriend, because she's had it for two years." And he too said possession is nine tenths of the law. I said, but. What about the fact that she stole the dog? Yeah. So if you get the dog improperly, you shouldn't be allowed to keep it. And in that particular case, this judge, I'd love to say his name in the court, but I won't, said, <laughs> look, he called me to the sidebar and he said, I, I, you will never win at trial. Wow. I said, but you haven't seen any of the facts yet. He said, I don't need to. I'm never taking the dog away from that person. So that's, that's, that's it's intense. pretty frustrating. So we're really in the infancy mm-hmm. of getting the of dogs getting the type of respect. And and I get that, and that's the challenge, but that's the fun part of bringing these arguments to people who yeah. just, at first, like, How, do I really have to deal with this case? But yeah, you do. We paid our filing fee, and, and we want a fair hearing, and we'll get there. Yeah, It's I mean, very interesting, the status of, of pets, especially dogs, in the society. Because, like, sometimes I compare us as veterinarians a little bit to auto mechanics and a little bit to dentists or human Or physicians. pediatricians. Somewhere in between. And it's almost like they are in that strange in-between status yeah. of between a car and a pediatrician. Child. Yeah, I feel like it right? is. Because like, right. I feel as though the kids really can't advocate for themselves per se. You know, so we're sort of having that pediatrician role of taking care most of most people right. would draw but, a very firm line between a child and a pet. Well, yeah, but I mean, I would as well. Way. I mean, you know, you, yeah, need, you need to have some sort of... But not every owner would. Well, it's true. But I mean, I think, you know, distinguishing, you know, human versus, uh, you know, an animal life, I do think, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily compare us to pediatricians, but I also... I hate when we're compared to mechanics. I know. I feel like yeah. I hate the fact of thinking that these dogs are like a car. And but I was just thinking about in that situation that that judge may not have even given the same respect that they would to a vehicle, yeah. right? Because right. you would never say that. Right. Well, this I'm person like, isn't this grand theft have auto? The car, <laughs> it's like right. So they get to keep grand it. theft dog. And and I, I I've been getting very heated where I almost feel like at times I'll even say to staff members who are with me, did I, did I cross the line? But mm. I feel like I have to be over the top yeah. to get them to understand that this, they would give a car more, more of a thought process and more of an investigation. Because right. there's right. a title. I mean, right. I don't know. Right. Like, there's right. legal documents. And Maybe that's the key. Well, I mean, do people <laughs> call the cops if somebody steals their dog? They do. And, right. I mean. And what... What the police tend to say is, you know what, this is a civil matter. Mm-hmm. I've had cases wow. where the like, police will show up at somebody's mm-hmm. house, but for the most part, they say it's a civil matter. You've got to go to court on this. Um, in along the lines of a car, this week for some reason, I've got three cases, three calls where people bought a dog from a pet store or a breeder, and then something's wrong with it. Mm-hmm. And and there actually is a a lemon law for dogs yeah. in Massachusetts, but. Um, you know, these people, they, they've put out so much money, and usually some of these pet store contracts say we're capped at a thousand. We'll only give you a thousand back, or we'll take the pet, back. Oh, or yeah. they take the pet back. At that That's point, a big one. The person has already fallen in love with the <laughs> right, dog exactly. or cat, they know, right. and they've invested money, and you know what happens, especially if it's a breeder who yeah. doesn't want a, a dog out there that's going to harm the name mm-hmm. of their line. Just yeah, it's not, not good, good things. It's not good. Uh, but so you you see the same things. Yeah, I mean, we often, I mean, you, you, we see those, the initial pet exam, right? They bring them in within their 10 to 14 days to have it evaluated. And I mean, you can already, you oh, can they're see, already attached. like, right. so are we evaluating this dog to see if you're going to return it to the pet store? And they're right. like, no, absolutely not. No, no, I cannot think of one owner. I mean, I have picked <clears throat> up on new puppy exams, either heart murmurs or, right. you know, other congen- like hernias or other things like that. Um and I haven't had one owner say, well, that's it. I'm giving it back to the breeder or right. the pet store. Never. And that's, what's, that's what I love about my practice is I, 
they're in for a fight. Like mm-hmm. the, people are mostly up for a battle. And when I take these calls, I always picture it as if it's my dog yeah. because the first case was. So I get this sort of like uh, this mentality comes over me like they're doing this to my dog. Mm-hmm. And getting back to your car point, because it's a great analogy with a dangerous dog, because we've used this. Uh, if somebody's car hits somebody, somebody's driving it and they hit somebody, they don't say we're taking your car away. Right. It, but yet your dog was at the other end of your leash might bite somebody and say, oh, we're going we're gonna to take that dog and put it down. So there's just things that when you line them up, they just don't make sense mm-hmm. because of the, this, is it property or is it, is it more right. property? Right. Mm. And the legislature just isn't modern. Haven't, hasn't modernized the laws to, to fit how pet owners feel. Mm-hmm. But again, the reason is because there's so many financial ramifications of doing that. Mm-hmm. What about like as veterinarians? Like if we have a pet that has a, you know, husband and wife or two spouse owner, there's two owners, multiple owners, and we have uh, a, a drastic difference in opinion on the type of medical care that that pet should receive. Uh, one owner might want to do everything, whereas the other owner might want to either euthanize or not do anything. You know, where does that sort of fall as far as legally? You know, are they, what do we do? What do right. they do? You know? So there's a concept of guardianship where it hasn't happened that much in this state, but where I, I or any lawyer could go to court on your behalf to to get a guardian appointed to help make the decisions for the animal. But I think another helpful thing would be if we all had pet insurance, just Mm -hmm. to take Mm -hmm. that piece of, can we pay for this? The financial part out. I mean, it's brilliant to take that out of the equation so you can really look, is this gonna help the dog or is it just extending a life that's not gonna be, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the dog would probably not rather live. But um, the liability for you, if you make one decision, well, it is. It's a owner. lot of us just having to really talk it through and basically counseling both of them yeah. to try to get them both on the same page. Well, you and know. if they're both listed, I mean, that's, you know, back to your, like, which, which owner is really the owner. If they are equal, right, mm-hmm. I've seen both. I mean, there's some clients that I have that I, I see both of the owners every day. And yeah. every time they come in, they, it's always both the husband and wife that bring them in. Yes. And so if one of them presented the animal for for euthanasia or for some treatment surgery or something like that i would trust that yeah i wouldn't even think twice to say should i call up right. your wife to ask mm-hmm. would you at least get it in writing or they yes. sign off they some sign kind off. of authorization yeah, they, they sign always off. sign everything in writing yeah. Yeah. yeah that's the key yeah. in this society yeah get yeah. it in writing Jeez. well i guess i mean we've had a quite we, oh should we see if we have any questions from do any we, of our we viewers have like any, any particular questions, questions? No yeah, viewer so. questions. We're good right so. now. Wow. Um, this is a really interesting. I feel like I could go on for, for hours. hours. You know, so bring it on. if attorney, if, to... if anyone does is in need of a pet attorney, how can they get in touch with you? Thank you. Uh, so the firm is Boston Dog Lawyers. Yep. So bostondoglawyers.com dot com or our eight hundred number, which is eight four four dog d o g a t t y eight four four dog. And we'll have that information on our. Um, comments and iTunes, YouTube in the show notes as well. Thank yeah. you. Um, excellent. And so um, we are, she's, she's uh, we're just wrapping up, but we, we want to thank you for coming on to our show. This is great having a guest. It adds a lot of flavor to the show. And this was just a very and we're cool certainly going to send clients your way when they have these questions because clearly we <laughs> You're have going to get a no whole lot busier. He has an knowledge. intern in, in studio, so <laughs> yeah. just pay attention. This is going to get busy. Um, thank you. Well, what you do is a great thing. This is a great avenue for pet owners to yeah. learn some things for yeah. the podcast. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so for our viewers on Facebook Live, we're going to take a little break because what we're going to be doing next is we're actually going to be talking about genetic testing in dogs. So we're going to set up for you, for um, four dogs that we're going to do DNA tests on, and we're going to have you guys all post what you think these dogs are. And then next um, episode, we're going to reveal what their DNA test showed. So That's give nice. us, stay tuned. Don't go away. 15 about 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. All right. All we'll right. be back. Thanks very much.